So what, what we're finding with brands is that you know, things like trust, honesty, reputation, transparency, they used to be the kind of values that would facilitate transactions. They, they've, they've now become the values. You know, you're buying trust. You're buying honesty. You're buying reputation. You're buying authenticity. I mean, kids are growing up faster than ever, uh, which is a problem because they're starting to adopt some of our problems a bit earlier on. Uh, but yet you've got old timers kind of acting more like children. So you've got this kind of, you know, this role reversal, young head and old shoulders, old head and young shoulders. And we're going to have to rethink age uh, because if you have kids today, according to the World Health Organization, you, ex you can expect for them to live to 100. So... Um, by 2030, there'll be 80 million people over 65 years of age. It's us. It's us. And because we're having kids later, there's going to be fewer young people to look after us. So that's going to have huge implications for housing, massive implications for transportation. We haven't really, I don't think we've woken up to this yet. Uh, conversations have become products. You know, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, these are all products, but yet products have become conversations. You know, BMW, when you look at their online social networking platform, it's a whole mishmash. Co-creation, big theme as well. And also um, sustainability, all right, it's a cliche term now, but there is a lot of work to be done in resilient design. And there was something I learned from Boeing, actually. And um, there's a, there, is a, there is a way to designing aircraft which is quite fascinating and all of it is built around uh, the purity of function. So reduction of weight, uh, lowering of weight, reduction of part count, the ability to retrofit product, uh, a product that's adaptable and upgradable and changeable because frankly you don't know what's coming around the corner. You don't know where your next war is, where your next recession is, you don't know what your next technology is going to come and change the world, so what do you do? You adopt a flexible platform. Um, you can apply that criteria to a business, I think. Reduce the weight, lower the part count, make the business retrofitable, make it adaptable and versatile. So there's an interesting idea there that I kind of stole from, you know, design from aviation. And food is a huge area as well, of course. I mean, we're learning this from Hilton, but... Uh, Food will eventually replace um, medical providers as the primary form of healthcare. At the moment, a lot of our healthcare systems are calibrated around treatment, where in fact it should be calibrated around prevention, and food's going to have a massive role in that. I'm running out of time desperately. So, um, so much in the world is changing. We're, going, we're moving into an era where we don't really know what's coming around the corner, but we know that people are caring more. We know that brands are in the business of having a two-way relationship. We know that brands are very important, which means we need to think more strategically. Uh, multidisciplinarity is key. And it's less about products and more about experiences. I mean, that's, you know, you'll, you'll get that from any website, any design website. But what's interesting is that the fundamentals of design have not changed in 20 years, probably 50 years, actually. Design forces ideas into some kind of form. You know, marketeers can talk about design. They can talk about uh, conceptual and brand intention for a long time. It's the designer's job to codify that and to create it in some kind of tangible expression. You know, people don't like making decisions. People don't like being pinned down. People like to debate and discuss and go on. So design brings form to concepts. Design helps translate technologies into behaviors. And also, design's a great tool in forcing people to make decisions and to, and to arrive at clarity during you know, somewhat ambiguous situations. So uh, here's a few slides. Um, that, uh, this, this is basically my last 20 years of learning. I, I'm passionate that design actually tells you more about the audience than it does about the designer. You know, design, um, design is a barometer for what we're prepared to pay for. You know, a design is a barometer for what we, are, what we accept, you know, what we want to love, what we take, what we take home, how we use it, how, how it makes us feel, what we say to others about what we buy. And I think it was Dave Ogilvy that said that ad advertising mirrors society. Well, if that's true, then design for me is a barometer of our taste and our expectations. I mentioned it earlier. So the brief is the most important part of the whole design process. I would rather spend double the time on the brief and get the brief right. 
And I've worked on both. I've worked on projects where we had a great brief and the whole thing ran like clockwork. I've worked on projects where, from the outset, there was ambiguity and there wasn't clarity and it was a complete and utter disaster. So if there's one thing you learn from me today, invest time in getting the brief right. Uh, the brief itself is a strategic document. Phase zero is a very important stage in the design process. Uh, design, as I said earlier, is probably more about asking questions than it is about providing answers. When you ask the right questions, you will then yield the right answers. And also, um, I have to be honest with you, design is one voice within a much, much wider ecosystem. You know, JetBlue, are they going to invest $20 million in a new seat, or should they pay their staff a little bit extra? Because it's all about the service. They've got tons of research like that, which is all about a great experience is normally through the service and not the product. You know, arguably, you know, a customer looks at the experience in its entirety. But design is just one voice around the table. You know, you've got HR fighting for funds. You've got R&D fighting for funds. You know, you might have customer service fighting for funds. Um, partly the reason why there isn't any real design representation at a senior level. I mean, in the UK, we don't have a design minister. We have an arts minister. We have a finance minister, obviously. We have an engineer. We have a um, sustainability minister, but still no design minister. Yeah, learn that from Boeing. And also, design often bridges people that don't normally speak. That's the other big learning. You know, for, for an experience to be uh, created and managed cohesively, it normally brings it normally means bringing together. Um, parts of the organization that don't commonly interact. And innovation often comes through uh, being disruptive, you know, being naughty, being maverick. You know, so many innovation programs fail, and that's not because they're not trying hard, there's not good intent there. It's because they're doing everything the right way. You know, they get a project team together, they get representations from all the business, they have a clear, cohesive vision, they have a budget for it but they don't often yield the type of innovation that they're craving for. That's because they're doing everything right and they're not doing anything wrong. Great innovation normally comes from doing things wrong. So I'm a big, um, I'm a big hater of multidisciplinary agencies because I think it kills creativity. And you know, this was a model that, you know, if I would have grown up in the, in the 70s and 80s, I would have adopted it, but a lot of big design houses have a industrial design department, a graphic design department, an interactive department, and a whatever it would be, an interior design department. And the problem is, when you've got these silos, the only way you can manage them is to incentivize them separately. And when you incentivize this, these group of people, they're gonna be competitive, and they're not gonna to speak to these people. Now, my agency, there's no hierarchy, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no silos, and there's an, absolute, uh, there's an absolute integration. So in many ways, there's a, the, the kind of the legacy multidisciplinary agency may not be a, a relevant model anymore, but the, the team of multidisciplinarians is. There's a difference. And if you are in, if you are in the innovation industry, you're actually in the you're, you're actually in the culture change industry. The biggest barrier to innovation is people. It's people resisting change. Um, it's people promoting and defending their own objectives. It's corporate politics. So if you're, if you're serious about innovation, it is about changing the way that the company thinks about itself and how it does those things. So I'm very passionate about this. Um, for me, I can't design without understanding the brand. I mean, how do, you know, how do you know you're doing it right? You know, you can produce something that looks good, but how do you know that's right for the client? Yeah. So this is where I'm at. Um, I think we're all, by and large, agree we're in the business of creating experiences. Um, but it's the way that we interpret the experiences, which is key. Um, experiences generate some kind of emotional response within us. And it's how we read those emotions that the experience creates. So we're actually in the business of facilitating people's memories, actually. Oh, I love this. Um, yeah. Just, it does what it says on the tin, doesn't it? You know, employee indifference is the biggest threat to brand engagement. You know, if your people are not aligned, if your people don't believe in what they're doing, then your brand is a, is a, far, is a farce, basically. I won't say anything about that. Great brands are lived. 
great brand engagement is volunteered. You can't command it. You can't, you can't make people write blogs. I've found that. You can't force people to be creative. It's Tuesday. It's blog day. Be creative. And I feel for you. I mean, look at my website. There's nothing there. But, you know, I was under pressure to create point of views. And she's over there. She gave me a nervous breakdown. No, I'm not going to It's difficult when you've got nothing new to say. It's really, really difficult. So here's another big idea, actually. Um, if brands truly want to be human, and if brands have to be true, then we have to acknowledge that brands are run by people, aren't they? I mean, people are brands, brands are people. And we, we, we screw up all the time. We're not perfect. I mean, God forbid, who wants a perfect world? So we, I, I think we need to accept that there's a beauty in getting things wrong. There's a beauty in failure. There's a, there's a beauty in losing. You know, you can, be a lo you can lose things but not be a loser. And I think that's, that's the reason why brands like the Ace Hotel are doing so well. They've embraced humanity. They, they allow themselves to get things wrong. So there's something very interesting about embracing vulnerability. This is my wife, and I, this is her photograph with no makeup on. And I said, I'm going to present you to 200 strangers. So it's the ultimate form of vulnerability, you know. Um, but I think there's an idea there for brands, you know. But that, that goes against every single convention that I've ever learned with branding. Branding should be about consistency, clarity, um, and having a clear vision. But, you know, consistency is a pillar of branding. So how can you introduce inconsistency within, within a consistent format? Because all of these brands claim to be human. Somewhere in all of these brand positionings, whether it's their tagline, their, their corporate governance, um, their brand positioning, their missions, vision, values, whatever it would be, they're claiming to be human, yet they don't really act as human as they could do. Great service will always save a bad product, but bad product will never save great service. And this is the key thing I've learned. You know, brand is all about really understanding behavior. Branding is a relatively straightforward process of application, but to, to understand brand is to understand the spirit of the organization. And the, the best brands are invisible, actually. You know, I can't remember what the Amazon logo actually looks like. I can't remember what the color scheme is. I think it's orange. I can't remember what the AT&T logo looks like. I can't remember what the typefaces of Coca-Cola. What's their lead type? I don't know. But I know what the companies stand for. So often, great branding is, is, a, is a window into the, the culture of the organization. This is interesting. I wonder if you agree or not. Um, brands have a masculine and a feminine persona. And they use it really, really well. So BMW, of course, absolute epitome of masculinity. You know, it's German, it's an engineering-based company. It's toys for boys, isn't it? It's fast cars, and they've got a valid place. But their expression is absolutely feminine, absolutely feminine. Same with Apple. iMac is a very direct, linear, succinct, masculine name, iMac. But yet, the products are very, very feminine. It's fascinating, this. And even Chanel. Did you know the Chanel bottle was designed to represent the head and shoulders of a man? Did you know that? Absolutely masculine form. It's like a brick, isn't it? Yet the, the brand itself is profoundly feminine, of course. And then the other really interesting thing, um, the design process is a masculine process. That's why so many industrial designers are men. Yet the branding process, which is fundamentally different, is a feminine-based process. Arguably, the, the industrial design process is logical. Look at Tom's presentation. Absolutely rigor, logic, analysis, common sense, and that's good, making things, producing things. It's systematic. It's task-orientated. And it's about solving problems. But most importantly, it's actioning. You know, every time Chandra has a problem, I want to solve it for her. But it's not about that. It's about listening. But the branding process is profoundly feminine. It's emotion. It's about allowing the company to have a personality. It's about collaboration. It's about bringing people together. It's about consensus. It's about diplomacy. Those are female qualities. Of course you need both. I mean, that's where the magic happens, isn't it? Thinking green is actually thinking blue. I made peace with thinking green about a year ago at Teague, actually, when I realized that the thinking green is about doing things in a different way. You know, it's about revisiting systems, methods, um, materials and processes, but also it's different types of conversations. It's joining the dots in different ways, and that's about creativity.
So for me, um, it's the person that brings the magic to products. You know, these are inanimate objects, aren't they? They can't think, but I bring the magic like a relationship. I bring the magic to that relationship. I see beauty in that relationship. I see beauty in a product. Um, so really, we, we express our own beliefs on a, on a product. And uh, if you follow that train of thought, then I think it's our responsibility to educate our audiences to understand what good design is. And that, that's going to raise the standard for everybody. There you go. I've run out of steam because I've just flown for 26 hours. But um, it's been a complete pleasure to speak to you today. And um, I hope we get to meet again. Don't know where, don't know when. Thank you. <laughs>